nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gerhard. So I'm going to start out by, by going to NanoHub's homepage and um, just give you a brief overview. So NanoHub is all about making data and simulation pervasive. We want to give modeling and simulation tools and educational materials that normally would be very hard to obtain. And um, so we're about modeling and simulation and we have a bunch, like over 500 apps and tools in NanoHub all around nanotechnology. Um, you can conduct research with it and you can also use it for learning and teaching. And for the learning and teaching part, we've assembled ser uh, several tools and I'll be talking about one of the tools today, Abacus, the which is in the simulation powered curriculum. We also enable people to develop software in various platforms. So we have Jupyter Notebooks, we have Linux workstations, and we have engines and frameworks for complex calculations and machine learning items. And then once you have tools, you might want to publish your teaching materials or your lectures or your tools. And we have a platform for that. And all of that really makes up our community. Now, we also inside Nano, we created Chips Hub. So you can go to chipshub.org. And if you do that, you go to a group that is inside Nano Hub. But chipshub.org is easy enough to remember. And in there, we list uh, um, several of our courses that have been literally used by millions of people. And we have free textbooks we feature that are new, uh, that are free to download. And they some of uh, they, these textbooks go with some of the courses that we have listed as well. And we have full-fledged chip design tools and TCAD tools. Uh, so we have Silvaco uh, TCAD installed, and we're in the process of installing Cadence and Synopsys and uh, open source pipelines for chip design. So, so you see full tools. And I also want to highlight then today uh, immersive learning approaches where you can introduce that into your classroom. So there are, uh, I'm going to highlight here, semiconductor device fundamentals today, but there's a couple of different tools that you might find useful. So if you click on here, you go to a tool suite called Abacus. And that's a, it's in a group on Nano. It's been published for a while. And Abacus really runs through a standard semiconductor um, course where you start out from crystals, you develop band structure models, you have maybe bulk semiconductors in the course, and then you start to understand and model PN junctions and the bipolar junction transistor. And then towards the end of the course, typically you have MOS capacitors and you have MOS MOSFETs. So these are animations that were created with this Abacus tool set. And actually it's a, a tool of tools. So there's multiple tools on the inside of Abacus. Each of these topics, so for example, here the MOS capacitor, we have uh, materials such as exercises, Etc. where we also have a faculty page where we can begin to share solutions and more engaging materials. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, MOSCAP. So if I click on run the Abacus tool suite, I am already logged in, it launches this tool. So as I said, Abacus is a tool of tools. So here are the various tools that are embedded in Abacus. So as I said, you start maybe from crystals, um, you explain band structure. You might have realistic band structure for silicon or band structure in, in nanowires and ultra thin bodies. Uh, there's a carrier statistics lab, drift diffusion lab. Then, as I said, B, uh, PN junctions. Last week we talked about bipolar junction transistors. And here is this MOS capacitor lab. So if I click on that, it uh, flashes sort of a, a page of accumulated material where you can download also some some exercises. But here is the tool inside Abacus. You can always go to a tool and shape it a little bit so it fits better into your screen. So I'm just making it a little bit wider here. May I make it a little shorter? So now it, it really fits into the screen that I'm displaying here. All right. So this is a MOS capacitor and you can configure it 
in in various gate configurations. So here's a single gate uh, configuration, and there's a single gate uh, like this. You can modify it to be an N type or a P type. Uh, there's also configuration of a double gate um, that is reminiscent effectively from a, a FinFET like structure where you just have a gate on the side. And but I'm going to focus today on a, on a single gate P type MOS capacitor. And I pulled some slides uh, from my from my class that I teach. I'm going to share those slides. So so here's an MOS P type MOS capacitor under under bias, and you can uh, play through it. We can determine where the electrons and holes are sitting. So here you're in accumulation mode where there's a bunch of holes piled up and you have electrons on the on the metal side, but there's no band bending because there's so much carriers that the bands don't even bend. There's no screening. So we call that accumulation. And as you bias in the other direction, uh, you start to pull the bands down here in the semiconductor. So you won't have the holes. In fact, you have few carriers and you start to build a depletion region where you're exposing the negative charge, in this case here for the P-type device. And now you see a clear difference between, uh, here's the oxide in the middle, you had separated electrons and holes. And now instead of electrons and holes, you have a lack of electrons here on the metal side and you have a bunch of exposed acceptors. So what should happen? So you, you have separated two charge carriers from the left and the right, that's a capacitor. And here you have separated the charge uh, further. So there's more charge further away from the oxide. So the capacitance you should see is getting smaller as you shift the bands over here. Now, if you increase the voltage further, so we call this the depletion region. If you shift the voltage further, um, you go into a, an inversion layer where you can begin to have electrons that are sitting here in the notch. Uh, at some point, there will be a transition area, a time a voltage where you have exposed acceptors and eventually you will have additional inversion electrons that are starting to pile up by the interface. And then you have a simulation a situation from the left and the right that looks similar, except the um, the charges are opposite. But for a capacitor, that doesn't mean much. The capacitance roughly here should be the same if you have electrons here. And if you don't have electrons here, maybe uh, uh, then the capacitance should be the same as here in depletion. So you can certainly play with that. And the question now is uh, what, how fast can you get charges in here? So here in the um, in accumulation, you have majority carriers here. There's lots of them. Whatever you do in terms of wiggles here, in terms of potential, changing the potential, there will always be enough holes. They will respond within the plasma frequency response time. Now, if you're um, depleting the electrons uh, um, here, the holes here, and leave acceptors uh, behind, um, you really have no carriers that can uh, respond really fast. And all you do is you modulate the charge here at the tail end, on the far end of, of these um, potential. And here in inversion, somehow you have to get electrons up here if you want to have um, inversion uh, electrons up there. So there will be relaxation processes or time dependent processes that will have the electrons up there. So if you modify your potential too fast, you will not have electrons up there because they can't uh, come up through a thermal generation. So that's the, the operation principle of a MOS capacitor you can do some calculations on um, recombination rates. So here, um, the response times here in the um, 
and the uh, accumulation and depletion is is very fast because everything happens with the majority carriers. And if you're dependent on electrons here in the inversion layer, it's a slower process. All right, so in this case, you have a capacitor with just two plates. Here, what you have is really two serial capacitors and the overall capacitance will be lower until you bring in uh, these uh, uh, electrons here. All right, so um, that's really how an MOS capacitor works. And I just pulled these uh, things out of my lecture. So let's play with it. So let's take a, a mildly doped um, uh, p-type um, p semiconductor. We have a 0.1 micron um, insulator and we have a metal. You can, um, uh, right now, the gate electron uh, trode is a N plus polytype. You can put in other uh, materials here that will have different work functions. Um, you can have different oxide thicknesses. Uh, you can have different body thicknesses. And there's some numerical stuff in terms of specifying how many numerical nodes you use to resolve the spatial region. On the parameter side, you can uh, change some fixed charge density in the gate insulator at the uh, interface trap charges. You can modify some environmental parameters like what temperature, what voltage sweep you go over, uh, how many voltage points you'd like to have. And also, uh, it calculates the AC response. And there, you'll see there's two responses. One is slow, one is fast. So here at a very fast oscillation frequency at um, a megahertz, we will see one CV uh, characteristic and uh, slower we see another. And you can specify the carrier lifetimes. And then you can modify the surface potentials as well. So let's just go run the plain vanilla structure. And this ran really fast because actually the result had been computed multiple times. Uh, so if you uh, had uh, created the, the real input deck for the real tool, which you don't have to use in these apps, you would have had to speak Padre. So under the hood, this tool runs a real full-fledged industrial strength tool that was donated to us to, uh, by Bell Labs. So here's the, the output log that was generated. And here, let's look at the... Um, C, C over C aux uh, characteristics. So actually the, the uh, unnormalized curve looks like this. So you have, uh, here's the analytical uh, oxide capacitance that you can just calculate from, uh, from geometry. And here you have the region of um, accumulation. And as you begin to uh, uh, deplete uh, by applying a voltage, the, um, the semiconductor, uh, your capacitance drops and uh, it stays low if you're oscillating the system at a high frequency. So here's the CV characteristic at a high frequency. If you're uh, applying a, a slow um, signal, uh, you can see that um, at the low frequency, again, you now have inversion layer charge piling up and the capacitance goes back up. You can normalize that curve. That's what often is done by this um, uh, analytical CX. So, and then you plot this and you just get uh, this curve here. You can, in this tool, you can download uh, the data. You can download the image uh, here with a download button. It offers you um, a view of the bandage diagram at, at zero gate voltage. So here at zero gate voltage, this is at flat band. Uh, the band is, is bent. So you have um, really a depletion charge here. And um, in the far deep semiconductor, you have a P-type semiconductor as you expect. And um, you can look at the hole density and the electron density and the, the hole density, what do you expect? You expect to see a lot of holes here. And then here, you don't see holes. So let's look at the hole density. So indeed, you you have uh, at the dopamine of 10 to the 15 holes sitting here at zero gate voltage. 
and uh, then you're depleting them uh, by uh, an order of magnitude or more uh, here at the interface. Uh, electron density, there should be uh, very little. So look at, this is 10 to the 13, compare that to the doping level of 10 to the 15. So that's four orders of magnitude, uh, yeah, two orders of magnitude different. And we can now look at the bandage diagram at the last applied bias. So, so now you can see that here's the P-tab side, but we increased the bias such that um, you now are in inversion. And let's look at the uh, hole density. Again, you have uh, 1E15 here at the doping level, you have depletion here, and the electron density should be significantly higher. There's a huge spike of electrons here. And then you have the electron density uh, decrease. So you're going up beyond actually the the doping level. So we're in in uh, in, in deep inversion. So so that's good. So we we can sort of see all the features that we expect to see. Now you can begin to uh, look at maybe a device where I can change the doping level by one order of magnitude. I hit simulate. And I think this one I've run as well. So it should just load a, a previous result. Uh, um, number one here, you can uh, compare these curves here. So you can also put the click on the all button and you can see uh, that the overall the curve seems to shift and the capacitance um, drop gets smaller. So why is the uh, capacitance drop getting smaller. That means effectively you have more carriers that are um, the, the the charge uh, separate. The capacitance is getting larger compared to the um, the lower doping case. So if we look at the band edge diagram at applied voltage, you can clearly see that. With different doping, we have moved um, the Fermi level here uh, closer uh, to the um, valence band. And over here, we have obtained much uh, more band bending because we have a much higher level of, um, of doping by one order of magnitude. That means the depletion region is getting smaller. And that means your, um, your capacitance is also getting larger because the spread of the charge, the capacitor is getting thinner, as, if you will, because the depletion region is not as wide. So you can see that, and then we can go out and and make it to more modern uh, doping, and to the 17, simulate that and see how the bands move in that case. So now you see uh, the, uh, the trend, um, you start out from low doping, higher doping, and you see um, how the capacitance uh, drop gets smaller, so to speak, so the capacitance remains large. And that means the bands are much more bent and you're confining charge more and more to the gate. And um, then that calls into question whether this is actually a meaningful uh, calculation because at very high doping uh, you're really confining the carriers really um, very sh um, sharply to to the interface so so the general trend is right um, we can uh, compare uh, these curves and again you can uh, look at um, by clicking the all button you can compare all three of simulations that are ran or you can just turn that off and sort of see the movement here. Now I want to show you some some things that, that look kind of um, strange um, and give you some ideas. So so 0.1 micron is 100, 100 nanometers. That's an incredibly thick oxide. That's old technology. Much, much more modern technology would be um, 10 angstroms or 15 angstroms. So uh, let's just at least um, go to one uh, so to to ten nanometers and see what happens. So we'll have very high doping, 
Uh, we make the oxide much uh, thinner. And we see all kinds of stuff happening here. The, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the high frequency CV looks right in the simulation. The low frequency stuff looks really noisy. And that's really a consequence on how the, the tool works. Um, um, it's a reflection of how it steps through these calculations. If you, if you go in and uh, basically say, well, I make my relaxation times really, really fast. That means I can have um, a really fast excitation uh, into the conduction band. You will see that this noise disappears in the calculation. But this is um, basically an, uh, an indication how, how badly the, the, the code was actually converging. So I haven't run this simulation, as you can tell, because now it's actually running uh, this tool under the hood as an engine. And we should see a curve that's much smoother. So, um, so it's really highlighting the role, if you will, of of um, uh, the relaxation time. So even if we said, okay, we're going to uh, do the analysis, like run really slow, like 0.1 hertz, run the same thing. This has been run. This will probably lay just on top. It should. So basically the results will lie on top. But what if I, I I'm really driving the tool to... Um, to its extreme, if I just do something like one second a lifetime, meaning it's going to be really hard for any um, carriers to 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 be excited in the inversion layer. Um, we should see a curve that is similar to the high frequency curve, or it's going to be very noisy. This is an experiment I haven't run, so I would just let students lose on this part with maybe inspiring to try the different features of what, what carrier relaxations, et cetera, do. So you see, it's, it's very noisy. Um, it didn't quite do what I expected, which was just follow this. All right, so let's clear this one and clear the noisy ones and, and live with a more reasonable approach of, of running real slow and relaxing it really fast. And so I had, um, what did I do? Compare, let me just clear this. And since I, it stores these simulations, I can just pull them back up. And previously I had um, run a 0.1 micron um, oxide, and I want to compare these two. So if I compare these CV characteristics in the, in the, um, this is the relative um, normalized, if I put them on absolute scale, so if you make the um, oxide thickness thinner, you go from 0.1 to 0.01, obviously your overall capacitance should go up by a factor of 10 ballpark, just by classical charge separation. So and that's what you see and it's helpful, that's why it's helpful to normalize to the oxide capacitance and compare these curves. So overall what you see for the thinner oxide, you also overall shifted the curve over to smaller voltages. And why is that? Because you need uh, much less voltage to to shift the, uh, the potential around. So let me look at the energy bind diagram here. So in one case, uh, we have very strong doping. So so we actually need don't need all of this depth here in the in the potential. And uh, you see the shift in the potential here at the gate, and that's, that's what results here in the CV uh, characteristic in this shift. So there's other ways, of course, to, to shift um, potential. So I'm going to go back down and doping a little bit, 0.1. Uh, 
Okay. So here's your uh, CV curve, and now we can maybe play a little bit with some environmental parameters or fixed charges. So if I, for example, put a, a, a surface trap um, density of say 10 to the 1, 3, 11, and simulate that, I'm placing positive charge at uh, this interface between the semiconductor and the oxide. And of course, there should be uh, a change in the overall um, performance of the device. And put them together. So I shifted by putting a, a positive um, a charge density on onto the interface. I shifted the curves, uh, the curve to a, a lower voltage. And of course, if I do the opposite sign here, it should shift to the right. Um, you can do something similar where you put a charge density inside the gate insulator, uh, which sort of spreads out um, um, the overall CV. And I see some questions popping up. So we're at the half hour mark i'll be uh, i think i'll be happy to uh, to entertain questions um maybe uh, you tell me what other simulations you would like to see but uh, th this is a good stopping point here i think all right the first question what is the typical thermal generation recombination times how would the plot look if there is some leakage through the oxide well those are two different questions um, so first of all, this tool does not do tunneling through the oxide. So this is a purely classical calculation. There's no tunneling that is turned on um, in this simulation. One can turn tunneling on into Padre, but in this particular tool, we haven't turned this on. So actually, that's a, it's a good question. Um, maybe, um, Amy, could you take that down? That's That's a cool feature we should have we can probably easily add to have a tumbling yeah. model. I'll make a note. Uh, turn, turned on in this. Um, and what are typical uh, thermal generation rates? It depends on um, what you want to achieve. Sort of a, a nanosecond is, is quite typical. Um, so we're talking about these rates here. Uh, sometimes people actually do introduce um, uh, recombination centers to to make the lifetime really short uh, for really fast devices that can happen and for some detector devices but in uh, this would be a typical number actually uh, a nanosecond or so all right the next question i see can cv curves for other semiconductor mos capacitors be simulated or only silicon It looks as if this tool is restricted to silicon. Um, I would again say if you want to explore other things um, that can be done. Um, so here you see this is the, the Padre input deck. One could in principle feed in other materials like what we have in, in most other um, uh, Padre based tools, but I'm surprised that we don't have um, other materials like germanium or gallium arsenide or, or like here. So no, not in not in this version in this tool, but that's that could be a good enhancement as well. All right, I can take a note of that. And the next question, how could this tool be useful for studying the ferroelectric properties of MOS2? I don't think it can. I mean, MOS2 is a completely different material set. Um, MOS2 can be handled in my NEMO tool, um, but that is not uh, not within the scope of this app and for teaching. Um, we do have some nano tools that deal with um, 
uh, 2D FETs um, in these novel materials. I'm not sure that they model specifically ferry electric behavior. Can wait and hang around. Do you guys have any other questions on what I should try to simulate or? And clearly you can go in. Uh, I'm going to set this back to zero. And I can. If I. I can clearly go in and do a single gate and then do an N type device. Should see just the CV curve flipped, right? So that's a typical thing when our students as well distinguish between an N type and P type semiconductor and look right at the shape of the CV curve. Well, that's running. Someone asked. Um, are there any other nanohub tools that study interactions of gas molecules and materials surface? Maybe. Well, this is not, that's not my field, but. Um, So there is a couple of tools where there are electronic structure calculations um, that deal with molecular structure, et cetera. Um, but I am not an expert in this. So, but I remember seeing images like this of having molecules on a surface, but I'm not an expert in that. So I'd, I'd say, try this out, try these, try these tools. All right, another question came in also, what if poly gate is lightly doped? Can this tool account for a depletion region in the gate? I am not sure, but we can, we can always try, right? So, I don't think you can set the doping in the poly. So you can't set it. Um, let me see what what the output log looks like. Yeah, so I see this tool actually like has only two regions. I mean, I don't speak pottery very well, but there's two regions, uh, region one and region two, and silicon dioxide is being specified in silicon. So in this calculation setup, I, the uh, poly is not explicitly included. Um, it's treated as a boundary condition, yeah, as a polysilicon boundary condition. Uh, which is um, which will not really calculate drift diffusion uh, properly. Um, so what you can do in principle is to um, to set up an input take like that where you have multiple regions and you uh, treat polysilicon as a material and look at the depletion in there. But that's not what's being set up here right now. All right, thanks, Gerhard. And I, I don't see any other questions right now. Okay. So thank you so much.